Today we light our second Advent candle in eager anticipation of the coming of our Lord and King, Savior, Redeemer, Emmanuel. Let this candle's light burn away our mourning, and we will soon rise to rejoice in His name. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we have already all waited for you in present uncertainty, yet in your anticipation, fill our hearts to your peace and our will to accept all people. Prepare us so our Savior Christ may find an eager welcome at his coming and call us to his side in the kingdom of heaven, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God.
shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is Psalm 72, which we will find on page 797 of the Book of Alternative Services. We will intone the psalm this morning. The refrain for the psalm is, Hail to God's own anointed, who rules in equity. And I invite you to joyfully sing the refrain when I raise my hand. Praise the 
today is number 106. There's a voice in the wilderness crying. We'll sing the first two verses before the reading of the Holy Gospel and verses 3 and 4 after the Gospel. 106. of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who wanted you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear forth worthy of re fruit of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ.
thank you to all of you, to the choir and the organist. I wait all year to hear there's a voice in the wilderness crying. And it's so appropriate for this morning. This morning, Reverend Vivian and I are talking about John the Baptist. It's what Reverend Tammy called a tag team effort. I start with some historical, religious, social baptism, all centered around John, and then Reverend Vivian is going to talk about repentance. So first, from our Christian scriptures, John was a prophet of priestly descent, whose mother Elizabeth was related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. As an adult, John lived in the wilderness, dressed in a camel skin, living off the land, eating lotus and wild honey. He was the man, as you just heard, crying from the wilderness in the hymn, in the gospel. Moving out from the wilderness as he began his public ministry, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Multitudes came to be baptized by John in the Jordan among them Jesus himself. Later, John was arrested, imprisoned, and finally executed by Herod Antipas. The disciples of John formed what's called a Baptist community, which continued to exist long after John's death. And apparently that community produced its own literature, fragments of which have survived in our own Gospels. Outside the Christian sources, and scholars are always looking for something beyond the, the source, the Christian sources themselves, the Roman Jewish scholar said that John was very much the famous prophet of his time, and it is clear that he was regarded as a, something of a threat to the various layers of imperial Roman and the royal household of Herod. Now, next I'm going to talk about two sects that were mentioned in that gospel, two religious groups that also have social and political connections, and those are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And then I'm going to talk actually about another group. So, who are they? You may know bits and pieces. The Sadducees are the, the elite, the aristocrats, very much centered around the temple in Jerusalem and its ritual, uh, tied to the Roman government and to the, the royal household. They clung very much to the first five books of what we call our Bible. The others they recognized as worthwhile, but not the major sources. Uh, fairly conservative in religion, but in their own lives, fairly um, secular. Now, opposed to the Sadducees are the ones called Pharisees. What we might call upper middle class, well educated, very knowledgeable about the law. They would go beyond the Torah, the first five books, to the other books and say, they're all God's word, they're all important. The Pharisees are more liberal, we might say, for their time, more modern. They accepted ideas like the resurrection of the dead, which the Sadducees rejected. Also, the Pharisees were very tied up with the idea of the interpretation of the law. So it's not just the words, it's what do they mean for this day. Now, those are the two most important, not the most numerous, of the religious groups in Palestine. But the ones that I want to spend a little bit more time on are actually some of the smaller ones that are so important for John. And the first one is the group called the Essenes. They lived in, the technical term is, eschatological tension, meaning they were expecting the end of this world at any moment. They generally opposed the priestly class of their day and the Herods, violently opposing both. And they look back to the early days of David and Moses and the priests of those times. They call themselves the members of the New Covenant. Does that sound familiar? Which would create a purified Jewish people. A Jewish people. They weren't really interested in anybody else. Although they continued to live in all the towns and villages and in Jerusalem itself, 
They tended to separate themselves off from the community, living in their communities, uh, dominated by a very strict code of behavior in things like what foods they could eat, uh, marriage, sex are allowed, but considered inferior to the celibate life. Uh, regular daily bathings, ritual bathings, but also tied, and this is important too, to the idea that the bathing must not be just associated with cleansing every day, but repentance. Now, the other group, perhaps an extreme branch of the Essenes, or maybe a community on its own, and that's the one we call the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the community of Qumran. I suspect most of you at some point have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found out there in the Judean desert, not far from the Dead Sea. And I visited that place. It's a magnificent, magnificent but terrifying place out in the desert with those wild hills up above in which the caves were found. And these are people who, even more than the Essenes proper, wanted to live apart, keeping all property in common, eating together, very strict uh, direction by their leaders. And of course, those ritual bathing pools. The scrolls, most of which are now in Jerusalem in the wonderful Museum of the Scrolls, are sometimes complete, but often in fragments, and that causes problems. And they contain both the traditional Jewish scriptures and some unique items. For example, one of their documents talks about the teacher of righteousness and his conflict with the man of lies. The, the Qumran community turned more and more inward, rejecting violently the life of the temple in Jerusalem as they strove towards a life of purity, intense prayer, study, control of the body, so that these would be the group they thought who, be, who would be ready to receive the expected Messiah, who would descend with his angels to meet them, the sons of light in this world, and wipe out all the sons of darkness. So they're looking for this coming conflict when they're there to reach out to the uh, Messiah. Many people think that John must have had some contact, maybe even been a member, either of the Essenes or one of those desert communities like the one of Qumran. But eventually, he left the wilderness, physically, even of his lifestyle, wearing those smelly camel skins and eating lotus and wild honey, recalled the wilderness. Just a quick aside, I happened to read last night one of the documents, and they said, oh yes, uh, but if they eat lotus, you have to put them alive into hot water or fire. So I hope John wasn't just picking up the lotus and shoving it in his mouth. <laughs> uh, now, so some of his attitudes are very much tied to the ones of Qumran and the Essenes. And I notice his attention, John's attention, to the practice of immersion and baptism in the Jordan. So John didn't just create this on his own. It's there, and his call for repentance. The Acts of the Apostles speak of a baptism of John, still practiced in Palestine by John's followers after the deaths of both John and Jesus. So that's your background, and now I turn it over to Reverend Vivian, who's going to talk about repentance.
John the Baptist, Geraldine and I were speaking briefly yesterday, and she pointed out that John left those companions and he went back to the main community of his people. Why did John do that? Well, he had a job to do. And this job was one that was set out for him before his birth, told by Isaiah more than a thousand years earlier. And that job, as Matthew tells us, was to make straight a pathway for Jesus, Son of God, a pathway to humanity, to the whole of creation. So John the Baptist left that retreat community to appear back in the Judean wilderness where people heard of him, and many came out. We've heard this in our gospel today. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, said John, and told those people in his place and time a message, sharing it, passing it on, in his very intense and driven manner, giving them a chance to repent and thus prepare for the wondrous gift they were about to be given the gift of God the Savior. Now remember, Jesus has already been born by this time, but he hasn't quite begun his ministry yet. He was about to begin his time ministering to and teaching them all. The kingdom of heaven was truly near them. And my main topic today, as Geraldine mentioned, is the meaning of repentance. The word means, of course, feeling sorry recognizing when we fall, when we follow the wrong path, when we hurt someone. And it includes going beyond sorrow to confessing and acknowledging our fault and atoning for it. And that's a widely recognized pattern. It's what even the children's book that I used to read to our kids calls the three stories. So it, it's a pattern that we all know well. In the Jewish tradition, repentance called teshuva means returning. A Hebrew word for sin is to go astray, to wander off. So there's a path we might follow, and sometimes we don't. Thus, the idea of repentance in Jewish thought is a return to the path of righteousness. It too has three stages confession, regret, and a vow not to repeat the misdeed. So there's one very important understanding that's needed. We need not just look backward and analyze what we've already done wrong, though that part is necessary for the restitution that we may need to bring to others because of our doings. But very importantly, we need to look also forwards to where God is pointing and leading us. So we look backwards, we figure out what we did wrong, we try to make up for it but then we've got to know what direction to set out in next. And we need to proceed in that direction. And that's what John did, leaving his friends and his comfort to walk where God led him. Turning around, heading in another direction, is a big task when we think of the world at large. We here could together spend hours naming all the things in our world that need changing and that to get us anywhere near the dream of peace and love and kindness held up so long ago by Isaiah, what we heard in our first reading today. But we don't live everywhere and in every time. We live here, now, together. So now, guided by our readings today, let's think. How can we find, how can we ourselves walk in God's direction? How can we learn to even think in terms of overall direction in our day-to-day -day choices made. Life throws things from all angles at us all the time. How can we get that consistency of direction? Well, first, what do we think God wants us to try to be and do in our world? What does God want us to imagine and to strive towards? Isaiah's words chosen for today describe a different and ideal world. The lion lies down with the lamb. There's no fear or hatred. The vision is a dream by which to set a course. Now, setting a course means choosing, pointing ourselves in a direction, and repentance is to point towards Isaiah's dream. We'll never attain that perfection in this life, but we are to use it as our compass. 
turning and redirecting our hearts day by day, even minute by minute. And there are many parts of our lives that we can start somewhere. In our individual lives, we can try choosing one, maybe just one element of our life in which to repent, in which to change direction during this Advent, to get us started. Maybe repair a relationship, perhaps think about and choose a new life-giving goal, or adopt a more conscious internal rule of kindness. And in our life in the wider community, can we identify one positive change of direction in society that we can in prayer, that we can support in prayer, in time, or in resources? Can we reach out beyond our walls in faith, say to get to know and share with someone who is quite different from me or you? Someone of a different faith, someone of a different community, and thus build community among more people. Can we pray for a local community issue daily, listening to how God might nudge us to contribute to that change? In our discussion of prayer after last Sunday's service, that idea of listening for God was met with great interest. People thought, some for the first time, I never thought when I'm praying to stop and listen. And we can do that in so many times and moments in our lives. It's all a matter of keeping God's will in mind. In fact, the Judaism of Jesus and for us as Christians, in those both, repentance and faith can be understood as two sides of the same coin. We cannot place our faith in Jesus Christ without first changing our mind about sin and about who Jesus is, and about what he has done for us. It is changing our mind from rejection of Christ to faith in Christ. And what's the result? The true penitent, as a medieval Jewish writer, Maimonides said, the true penitent is the one who finds himself with the opportunity to commit the same sin again, yet declines to do so. And our actions will change along with our hearts and minds. There's no true change of mind without causing a change in action. So we make these changes within ourselves and we will change. John the Baptist in our Gospel today called us to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and who has faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life. We can all continue to strive for that, and perhaps we'll see the changes in our own lives. And John the Baptist, well, he helped prepare people to let Christ enter their hearts, giving them opportunities to confess and be washed clean and start again. Someone as we do in our confession and absolution, whenever we worship together, not just in communion, but in confession and absolution itself. And as he predicted, Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, did come and give the lifelong gift of the Holy Spirit in his baptism, and so much more as well. It was a great turning point, a returning for the world. This week, as I was looking up things to talk about today, I found a poem by a man named John Shea. It's a very long poem, and it's about the life of John the Baptist. I found it very striking, and if anyone's interested in seeing it, tell me later, I'll send you a link to it. But in there, in this one part of the poem, he's talking about John the Baptist in prison, much later in the Bible story. <clears throat> in fact, when he's about to have his head cut off. But he puts these words of explanation in John the Baptist's word, of John talking about the difference between him and the Christ for who was to come. This is John speaking in the words of John Che. I can devour the word of the Lord like wild honey, but I cannot lace his sandal. I can condemn sin, but I cannot bear it away. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
So may we always remember to walk in the direction of God. I just want to end with one little quote from Linda Nichols, the primate, the chief bishop of our, of our Anglican Church in Canada, who said this, Advent calls us to see God's dream, and today we heard that in Isaiah's dream, and then show us how it has begun on earth. Let's be part of that. Amen. Now let us turn to page 188 and recite the articles of our faith in the Nicene Creed. Let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, beginning and out from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the earth to Mary, and was laid in heaven. For our sake he was crucified under conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This morning, we are going to use litany number two. Number two, number which is found on page 112. And uh, let us pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness, and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share in the good things you provide. Lord, hear our prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or mind. Lord, hear our prayer. Set and strengthen.
strengthen all who desire. Set free all who are bound by fear or despair. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying and your comfort to those who mourn. Lord, hear our prayer. Um, and we are praying for this morning in our, in our, in our cycle of prayer for the North End Churches. We pray for St. Martin of Scotland, Anglican Church, and with the Reverend Ed Travers. We, we also pray for those who have requested prayers from our prayer box. Um, in our family prayer cycle, we pray for Donna Swin and her family. We pray for Rod Taylor and Sandra Pope, and for all our friends and family, especially nephew Ariel Davison and all who are suffering. We pray for Scott Thomas and family, with special prayers for his friend Kenny, who passed away on Wednesday. We pray for the sick. We pray for Michael Rennie. We can pray for Michael Clough. We pray for Sheila Cooper, Heather Boutlier, Terry and Stephanie, Betty, Jeff, Sally, Mary, Gordon, Sean Walton, James Smith, Sue Woodstrom, Philip, Jamie Leslie, Jim, Carol, Ron Ike, Tom Blood, and for all those suffering from COVID-19 worldwide and their families. We also pray for the, the children and the parents and the families who are, are desperately seeking um, beds in hospitals right now, which are overcrowded. And we pray that that situation will be resolved as soon as possible. We pray for those who have died and those whose lives are darkened by sorrow and mourning. We pray for all those we love but see no more. And we pray, especially this morning, for Bill Quinn, who, who left us this week. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for our primate, the Right Reverend Nick, Linda Nichols, our Bishop, Sandra Fife, and for Alberton, uh, uh, Prince Edward Island, the Reverend Anne Bush, and for Cherry Valley, Prince Edward Island, which is vacant. In the world, we pray for the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem in the Middle East, and we pray for peace in that region. And and a, and a peaceful resolution to all conflicts. Uh, um, amen. Amen. We now turn to page 191. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness.
strength. We are nothing without you. Receive all we offer you this day, as you sustain us with your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today we'll be using Eucharistic prayer number three, which may be found on page 190. the blood of his new covenant. 
your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
5 to 9. God, my hope on you is founded.